Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I was saved, so-called, I put that in quotes, quote, quote, unquote. I was saved when I was a little boy, about eight years old. I believe I was about eight. We were going to a, sort of a medium-sized Baptist church in our hometown, and I was living with my grandparents at the time. And my grandmother, uh, she would just sit there. I would be crunched in between my grandmother and my grandfather in the middle here. I'm, I'm a little Stevie, and, and I'm playing with something that I would brought home from school, or I'd brought home, I'd, I'd brought to church. I, was, I would stick stuff in my pockets and take it to church and play with it. And we were, the pastor was just getting ready to give his sermon, and he gave his sermon, and he gave an invitation. And, of course, my grandmother, she nudged me. Uh, to go down the aisle. And I think that she did that because just a few days prior, I had set our grass on fire. And I was uh, out there with my little tiny cowboy boots and I was stop trying to stomp it out, the fire out, because it caught the whole grass on fire. I'd been playing with matches and uh, she had to call the fire department and uh, the fire department came and and they, they put us in the newspaper. They put little Stevie in the newspaper that night uh, talking about how that I had set my grandmother's house on fire, and after the fire department had left, come and gone, she set my butt on fire. And I remember giving my my life to the Lord at eight uh, that Sunday morning. But uh, as soon as I left the church, I never gave Jesus another thought for about twelve or fifteen, twelve to fifteen years. I did get baptized that Sunday night and joined the church. I was now a member, officially a member of the church at the tender age of eight. And I was, I was the only one baptized that night. They had the uh, baptismal, the baptismal all lit up, you know, behind the choir and everything with, you know, it was a pretty blue scene, you know, the water and everything. The lights were down dim and the preacher, he baptized me and, and, uh, of course, you know, I didn't, I didn't quite understand any of that, any of what was going on. As I said, I, I didn't, when I left the church, I didn't give, I didn't give Jesus Christ another thought for at least 12, 12 years, 15 years, maybe eight. I don't know exactly how long. It was a long time. Okay. And things just kind of went wrong with my life, in my life. And I just kind of wondered at times, well, maybe, you know, I just didn't quite, uh, do something right or or uh, maybe maybe the preacher didn't baptize me right but because you know nothing stuck of course uh, I have to say today that there's sort of two sides to that picture one is is that there's absolutely nothing wrong with what I did and there's nothing wrong with what my grandmother did and bless her heart, you know, bless her soul. She wanted little Stevie saved. And little Stevie, I have no doubt, she she had every reason to believe that little Stevie needed saved. I was I was a pretty honorary little kid. But nothing happened. There was nothing spiritual involved in this. Did God know that it was going to happen? I believe he did. Did I effectually receive the Holy Spirit, was born again by God from above, regenerated, quickened to life at, at that, on, at, on that Sunday morning or that Sunday night? Uh, I don't think so. What I, what I have come to learn is that I was always his child. And even though uh, a false sort of conversion was sort of you know, forced upon me uh, at that tender young age, impressionable young age you know it just didn't really do anything for me at all i it, there was nothing it wasn't really as much that i really i don't think that i really wanted to be saved as it was i just really didn't want to be in trouble with my grandma and so now i i proudly you know carried the badge you know the, the of honor you know being a christian you know for those years but uh, nothing ever really happened. I didn't understand at the time that my heavenly father, the very name father, implies that I have a father who gave birth to me, who begot me, and it was a divine birth, and that our heavenly father has a family, and I was a, a member of that family, and that he chose me and him before the foundation of the world. 
that I was elect and chosen. That's Ephesians 1.11, 1.1, as well as Romans 19. That I was saved freely by His grace. That's Romans 3.24. That I was drawn by God, uh, not shoved by my grandmother, but drawn by God. And it was at His timing. It may not have took place then when my grandmother wanted it to, but I was drawn. That's John chapter 6, verse 44. It's, it's in the first uh, chapter of John that I, I learned that it was God's will, not the will of the flesh, that, that were, caused me to become a, a child of God. I was begotten, says 1 Peter 1, 3. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says I was enlightened, as, as well as 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, 6. Or chapter 4, verse 6, which we just looked at, that faith was a gift and that uh, Christ's death was for me was substitutionary, that he died in my place. He became my kinsman redeemer and he died in my place. And we're called God's children and we were sown. That's Matthew chapter 13. We're, we were sown as wheat. Uh, even though there are, there are, there's tear that grows among the wheat, that's Matthew 13. Uh, there's sheep versus goats, and I was a sheep, not a goat. And goats don't become sheep, and sheep don't ever become goats. And, and that's John chapter 10, and First Peter again says that I was caused to be born again, that God did that. And I didn't do that at all. I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with my physical birth from my parents, and I had nothing to do with my spiritual birth, which was from my heavenly father above. And that began a long journey. It's continued on to this day to where that I've grown in that direction. I've grown in the Lord and the understanding of the truth of God's word that I'm saved, not according to my own will, but by God's I'm redeemed and that redeemed and saved are two different terms. And we've been studying together the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, where that the context is ministry, and we were at about somewhere around verse 6, and I suggested that the fifth chapter is not simply speaking of our physical body, but of our existence here in light of the work that we've done for Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians, we were told that Paul had laid a foundation as a master carpenter, uh, that we are to take heed, be careful how that we build upon that foundation. And the possibility exists that uh, what you build may remain or it may not. And we'll be looking at that, I think, in this video, somewhere around verse 10, if it's not verse 10 of chapter 5. We're going to be looking, taking a look at Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 1 uh, began, if our earthly house, our tent or tabernacle were dissolved. That's, a, that's as I pointed out, a third class condition. It's, it, it may or it may not be dissolved. If that earthly tent is, the, is only the human body in which you exist, this uh, carcass that we call flesh, it'll be dissolved. It, it will be dissolved. And so I believe that this chapter encompasses more than just the human body. Uh, but in fact, it characterizes the activity of that body in the work of Jesus Christ. The text says, if it's dissolved. That is, it may or may not be dissolved. And I know that my physical body is going to be dissolved. And so I'm not looking at a physical body here in this text, this context. And I know that's not the popular view. And I'm not saying, as I pointed out in my last video, I'm not saying that that's not included in this, that, we're not con that the Holy Spirit is not contrasting the physical body with our glorified body in heaven. I think that, that that's very much seen there, but I don't think that's the primary thought or the, that the Holy Spirit was trying to convey when he wrote this epistle. I don't think that's the context. We groan in this tent house being burdened. That's a passive voice. We're made to be burdened. I'm made to be burdened. And I, I take that as, as because basically because I'm, I'm constantly attending 
uh, to the ministry of Jesus Christ that he's given me, and, I've, and I pointed out in my last video, I think that we're all ambassadors. We all have a witness. We all are ministers of Jesus Christ, whether we stand behind a pulpit or preach on YouTube or anything else. And I suggested that it's because of that constant burdening in the ministry of the gospel of Christ that so many of his ministers are tempted to use shameful or dece deceitful tactics in order to avoid that burden, because not everyone is going to hear. His sheep will hear his voice. Those who are not will not. I believe very firmly that that which is highly popular here on earth is not of the Holy Spirit. The text just does not allow me to say that. We are persecuted, struck down, but not destroyed. We're, we are despised, rejected. We are considered to be the, the filth, the offscouring of the world system. You may work in the lives of some who are in that sort of environment, but the true faithful ministry of Christ is one of being burdened, of despair, of being rejected, cast down, and so forth. However, our desire in verse 4 is not that we get out of this. That's not what I don't think. I'm pretty sure that's not what that's saying. It's not that we'd get out of this, you know, to be delivered from it in the sense that it wouldn't, it just wouldn't be that way anymore. But rather that this particular life we now live might be swallowed up by the life. And I believe that to be the life of Christ, not in glory, but now. So that's the ultimate aim of our ministry. Paul says in Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And so our groaning is not that we wouldn't have this burden. I just believe that the burden of the fourth verse is that my work will remain and not be burned up at Bama. Because that's where we're headed in our text. So I think we're around verse 6, the, the present text, verse 6. Therefore, and what's the therefore, therefore? Well, the therefore says that, that based upon what's been all this that's been previously said, we are always confident, in the words courageous, knowing perfectly that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And if you want to take that as contrasting our physical body with our glorified body, that's fine. You go right ahead. I'll love you anyway, but I'm not going to agree with you. I'm not going to say that that doesn't include that, but what I am going to suggest very strongly is, is that it's not limited to that. And that there are sort of layers to Scripture, just like an onion, there's layers that we can see where the, there's maybe multiple meanings in the verses. While we are at home in the body. Now, what does that mean? Now, well, that means, Steve, that means that while we're here on earth in this fleshly body. Well, maybe so. I don't think so. Not according to the context. I think that there was a time in my life here where that I was at home in the body. I was at home in the body. I was resting. I wasn't working. I think if we're working, we're present with the Lord. I think if we're at home in the body and we're not working and we're resting, I don't I think we're absent from the Lord. Now, you may disagree with that, but if I am not involved in any kind of ministry, even though I'm an ambassador for Christ, I have a witness for Christ, I have faith in Christ, or I live by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, and I don't have any message, I don't have any ministry, I don't have a word to say to anybody, I don't hardly see how you can say that I'm with the Lord here, right now. Because even though the Lord is in glory and we, we are here physically, okay, our Lord is certainly not apart from us here. He can stand at the door and knock, and that's not open. And that has to do with fellowship. Verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And right away we want to think, okay, well, that faith's got to be talking about our faith. We walk by our faith. 
And I thank God, folks, that we don't. I'll just say it just as plain as that. If I had, if I was walking according to my own faith, when my own faith not only can but does fail at times, and I that I and I don't have all faith. Well, okay, Steve, that's just talking about you. Just walk by the faith that you have. Well, maybe that's true. But let me tell you something. Two generations ago, just two generations back, go back two generations, and every time. Anytime any Christian in this country, the United States of America, just about without exception, every Christian who read that verse looked at that faith as the faithfulness of God first and foremost. Before anything else, before they even began to entertain any thought, any idea in their minds about their faith in God, they read that and they understood, they realized that, that there was some, a foundation of, of truth supporting the faithfulness of God in the believer's life. And then from there, then they went on to talk about their faith. And when you talk about your faith and the faithfulness of God, your faith, your belief, your trust in the faithfulness of God, ultimately it comes to the life that we live. We live by the faithfulness of God, not by our own faith, because our faith will fail. And our faith is weak. And we don't have all faith. We can't live by something as incompetent and inefficient as our own faith. I'm going to take that as being that we walk by the faithfulness of God, not by what we see. And what is it we see? We see a lot. We see a lot. Our eyes are very open and our eyes are very, are perceiving, constantly perceiving the things that take place, not only around us externally, but all of that which occurs inside us internally. And to be walking by sight is to, is tragically to be walking by sight is to be walking in just total absence of any faith toward God whatsoever concerning anything because we're judging by outward appearances. It may, it may not, it may be, it is, it can be very well be true that, that, that what we're looking at doesn't confirm what we believe, but what we believe is true, whether what, what we see outside or externally, whether that, that, tends to confirm that or not, we can't make that judgment. We can't make that assessment. Our lives, we build on Jesus Christ. We, we, are, we are redeemed because God is faithful, not because we believed. My sheep hear my voice. Believe me. You know, I believe that what the text is saying, verse 8 is saying that in we're real, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. It certainly must include leaving this physical body and going to heaven and having a glorified body and being with the Lord in heaven. It must include that, but the context is ministry. It, it's all the way through. The context is ministry. I am willing to suggest that what the verse is primarily saying is that we're, we're, we'd rather be absent if we had our druthers, we'd rather be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord right now. We would rather be out of that, that position of, 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 of inactivity to a position of activity where that we're present with the Lord. Verse 8, where we are confident now and are pleased, not willing. The word is not willing, which would suggest that we have some will in the matter. It's well pleased. We are pleased rather to be absent out of the body and to be at home with the Lord. I think there are many Christians who are at home in the body. Right now, well, of course, you might, you, you, I can hear people saying, well, Steve, we're, we're all, you know, in the body right now. We're all absent from the Lord. But if it, it, we are, that's true. If you look at that from a physical versus a spiritual, uh, eternal, heavenly, you know, context but we are pleased rather to be absent out of the body we don't want to be just in our body doing nothing really in the cause for christ building instead of building on christ we're basically a christian we're an inactive christian we're not doing anything we're just in the body uh 
and we are pleased. We are pleased. Whether we're working or not, folks, we're pleased. God says that through Paul, we're confident, we're courageous, we're courageous that we are pleased rather to be, we're pleased to be absent out of the body. And, Kai, the conjunction, and it's not it's not saying both one or the other it's it's saying we are pleased to be absent absent of the body and we're pleased to be at home with the lord and again you know you can look at that from a physical standpoint you know whether it's it's contrasting our earthly body with our heavenly body or you can look at that as the context does which i believe is ministry to be at home at home with the Lord, and when you look at that word in the Greek for at home, the word is uh, in the meo. It means to be in one's own country, to be at home. It means to be bonded together by a particular identity, uh, to be present at home amongst your own type of kindred, related people. That's what the word means. And I think that that's what we are when we're in service for the Lord, for the Lord here. Therefore, we also are ambitious, and that word is a compound word. Uh, this is verse uh, 9, where ambitious is what the word, the text literally states. It's from a compound word. It's from phileo, deep brotherly affection, deep affection, and the word honor. Those two words are paired together. It is a very deep affectionate uh, uh Activity which is involved has honor associated with it. So we are ambitious, whether being at home or being away, well pleasing to him to be. And of course, uh, you know, there's where I pointed out, I think I might have pointed out in my last video that. It doesn't seem to make any sense to take this as our physical body if we're looking at going to heaven and having to be well put at being involved in some activity in glory where that we are either well pleasing to him or we're not because at that point he dries our tears there's no more pain no more suffering no more sorrow uh, I, do, I do not I, I, I it is impossible folks for me to take this as contrasting our physical body with our glorified body when it says that we are ambitious whether we're here on earth or, or in heaven we're ambitious to be well pleasing to him i don't think that we're going to be striving to be well pleasing to him in glory first of all we, we even now are, have been accepted in the beloved And we get to verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everything is building up, pointing to, it has the bema, the judgment seat of Christ, in view as we go through these verses in chapter 5. Uh, and you could, again, once again, you can argue, well, Steve, it's still contrasting our physical body with our glorified body and, and so on and so forth. But I don't think that's the context. And uh, if you take the view that I do, that it's not that, that it's really speaking more of what I'm about to point out here in a, in a moment, it's uh, it, it's not a bad, it, it doesn't contradict the text whatsoever, really. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't cause any friction there. So why does the text say, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be ex accepted uh, of him? If, if we are present with him, why would we be laboring at that time to be accepted of him? And since we have been accepted of him, even now, while absent, that, you know, that, that is accepted in the beloved, why should we need to labor to be accepted of him? Uh, Colossians tells us that we're complete in him, which is head of all principality and power. So why labor, present or absent? Either one. Well, it certainly doesn't have anything to do with our redemption, but it does with our reward. The passage, folks, is not, in my opinion, contrasting our physical, temporal, earthly body with our new glorified body. 
though it may likely include that. I think at home in the body and being present with the Lord is saying that whether we are working or resting, we may realize that we have been accepted of Him. There are many truths that we, and I've, I've explained this in other videos, there are truths that are positional truths. And then there's those, there are, there's truth that's conditional, conditional. And, and by that, what I mean is, uh, positionally, we are righteous in Christ. Uh, we may not, in our condition, we may not uh, appear that way. And that's, that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Positionally, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And so, uh, I think some are at home in the body and others are present with him now. I, 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 I think it's talking about the believer's condition uh, in this life, first and foremost. If so, being that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. We Folks, we've either put on Christ or we've not. You're either walking in his righteousness or you're not. Uh, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And, I, and I'm, again, I'm going to say that's here and now. We walk in life, newness of life. I look at the newness of life in Christ that we walk in as being almost, I guess, similar in identity uh, to the phrase that we're reading there. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. That's what we want. That's what we want. I just do not believe glorified heavenly bodies in glory is, is the primary sub subject of the chapter. You know, the, 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 the God is simply saying through all these verses in the context of ministry, all he's really saying is, is look, you know, be a lot better if you was with me than down there. And that's true. And I'm not saying that that is not. I'll, I'll never argue that it's not better to be with the Lord than here. I think verse 9 is a dead giveaway, uh, verifying that the subject being discussed, discussed cannot be our glorified body. Wherefore, wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And that word labor means... Um, the word labor there in verse 9, if you look at, at the Greek, uh, it's ambitious. It's from philo, phileo, affectionate, love, and honor. So were you, most likely at one time. Maybe some of you still are. I don't know how many people have, have look at this the way that I do. Uh, I, I can tell you that I haven't saw any... But he, any, anything in the literature that looks at this is, is in the present and in, in the context of ministry. But I, I'm, I also think John 14 does. Uh, if you read through John 14, it appears that he's talking about heaven, and I don't think he's talking about heaven at all. I think he's talking about something that leads into the 15th chapter where we're abiding in him, he, the vine, us, the branches, and it's uh, we're... Uh, we abide in him. There is, in, in my Father's house are many abiding places, says the text in John 14. The English has translated that mansions, and the, God knows what all people have done with that verse to, to make it seem like we're going to have a big palace like, you know, a big mansion like Mar-a-Lago or whatever, you know, like the Vatican or something in heaven. I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. I think it's saying that we are ambitious, whether at home in the body, that is resting, or present with him, working, we are accepted of him. Uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, uh, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There we, you see the word accepted there. Uh, uh, Romans 14, uh, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. You go to Hebrews 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the, of the sheep, uh, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work 
to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Well-pleasing, acceptable, same Greek word. Working in you that which is acceptable. Working in you that, folks, it ain't our works, it's his. We work in, the, in, in we walk in those works that he has established for us. The finished work of Christ is what we walk in. The word labor, literally ambitious, uh, you know, being, having an honor associated. We have a deep love for that which has great honor. Uh, the word willing, in verse 8, means well-pleased. We are confident, I say, and well-pleased rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And, and our burden, uh, our deep grief is not to be unclothed. I, folks, I don't think there's ever been a Christian that didn't grieve to be clothed or grieve to not to be found unclothed. You know, I don't think there's ever been a Christian that didn't grieve to be clothed. A deep burden to be clothed. It's just that most use law to try and clothe. No believer wants to be found naked, you know, unclothed, you know, standing in his own righteousness. Now, I understand there are many who are not aware of the fact that there's even a difference. But once you come to understand that we, you know, we don't live by our own righteousness, we live by his, I don't think that you want to... You, be found naked. And the context is vain. You know, I, I look at naked, unclothed. I look at that as wood, hay, stubble. I look at the clothed as gold, silver, precious stone. But I don't look at it as, as this, uh, you know, it's, it is, it's, what Bama does is separate that which was done in the flesh as opposed to what was done in the spirit, that which we did ourselves as opposed to what Christ did in and through us, our works as opposed to his, and that sort of thing. And it's it's wonderful how that all works out because a man's entire life's work singular can be burned up, yet he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. If you believe that it's contrasting human flesh with a glorified body, that's perfectly fine. I most view it as that. Uh, so we'll continue on here. We'll pick up here next Sunday. Uh Wednesday's video ought to be kind of interesting. I'm going to talk about the eclipse a little bit and several other things that's coming in 2024. Hopefully we're gone by then. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Let's have a word of prayer before we close. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the message that you've given us of grace, the, the message of liberty, that uh, so thankful for all of the grace and the mercy that you've given us to be able to rest in you and to trust you in all things. We just thank you that you guide us into all truth. Filter out that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is true. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.